my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rose And now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. And love beyond degree. Cause at the cross, at the cross, is where I first saw the light. And the burdens of my heart rolled away. I receive my side and now I am happy all the day. Can y'all help me sing at the cross? At, at the, the cross, cross, at the cross, where I first saw. Hi, my name is Angel Pagan, and uh, I always figure that my role at the church is whatever the church needs me to, to do. Uh, if one week I need to do the finances, I do the finances. The next week, if I have to clean the bathroom, that's what I'll do, you know. Uh, the small group that we have meets on Thursdays. Uh, we meet now as from 7.15 to approximately 8.30. Uh, the first week was kind of slow. I think everyone was kind of uh, feeling each other out and seeing what it is. Now it's just like one big, happy, dysfunctional family sitting around the dinner table. We get closer and closer every week uh, in, in the small group. Uh, I feel that the members of, of my group is my family now. You know, I talk to them. I, when I don't talk to them, I miss them. It's, it's a great experience, and I recommend it to everyone to join the group. You know, I, I attribute the making the sandwiches a lot to Bill, Bill Conrad. Uh, we were. When we first started the first group meeting, he says, I hope that this is not just a meeting to meet and that we accomplish something. I said, well, you know, it's funny you should say that. Our thought is that we, we should do something. You know, what it is, we don't know. But we all have felt that uh, making sandwiches and feeding the hungry is something that was near and dear to all of us, you know. I know as a child, you know, there were times when you know, my parents didn't know when our next meal was coming from. So that's always been you know, close to my heart to 
feed as many people as I can. And with Bill uh, recommending that and Linda jumping in and saying, yes, this is something that's near and dear to me, it just came natural for all of us. Uh, prior to not being able to use the church, when we were doing the church, like I said, we, we were up to making 550 sandwiches in no time, you know. Pack that last sandwich and we put it into the, uh, the cooler and we say, wow, you know, look what we did, you know. But we're doing it again, not for us, but for the community. The sandwiches is a great opportunity. Uh, Angel and Yvonne, we sit around the table. You normally when we make the sandwiches, we discuss our days, we discuss the good things that happened. Uh, if something went wrong, you know, we discuss it. Uh, we really enjoy the time we spend as a family and it brings us closer together. And I, you know, we, we, we're building memories here, you know, and, and we've also, you know, we, we feel that by doing this, we're contributing to the community and we're showing that we're not just, a, uh, you know, going to church, listening to a sermon and going home and that's it. We are the church. The church is not the building, you know, and what we do. You know, if we don't do community services, we don't help our brothers and sisters, we don't, we're not out there, well then we're just a building that's deteriorating and depreciating with no rewards. So this is it, you know, Jesus is here. Jesus is at the center of that table when we're making sandwiches, Jesus is at the center when we're delivering it, and Jesus is at the center of everything. When you miss the, uh, the pilot of a new show, you know, People say, well, if you miss the pilot, you miss it all. With a small group, no. Anytime you join us, the pilot of the new show, you make new friends, and those friends may become family. Happy Pentecost Sunday. I'm Ron Winter and I would like to welcome you to Wesley Church Online. Today we are concluding our sermon series titled Jesus Ruins Everything as celebrates the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of Christ Church. This series will introduce you to the real Jesus found in the Gospels and challenge the way you see everyday aspects of your life. An encounter with the real Jesus will take everything you know and ruin it for the better. So come and join us in the call to worship. Come Holy Spirit, inspire our hearts with your fiery presence. Let your flame burn within us, stirring us to action. Come Holy Spirit, energize our lives to work for God. Let your wind of hope swirl around us, lifting and moving us through complacency. Come Holy Spirit, pour your blessing on us. Let your presence challenge us to proclaim God's presence and love in everything we say and do. Amen. Please join me in the unison prayer. Almighty God, your Holy Spirit came to Jesus' disciples hidden in the upper room in Jerusalem. A violent wind and tongues of fire were the symbols of the new things happening in their lives. May your Holy Spirit burst into our lives today, encouraging and inspiring us to proclaim boldly the good news of Jesus Christ, who offers healing and hope to all people. Amen. My heart. 
hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Can y'all lift your voice and say that with me? Say, my hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. Than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Say, I dare not trust. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But holy trust. But holy trust. Christ alone, he's the cornerstone, and the weak made strong, in the Savior's love, and through the storm, he is Lord, he's the Lord of all.
make strong for the Savior's love. Lord, he is Lord, the Lord of all. Lord Lord. Thank you, Lord God. He's the Lord of all. Lord of all. He's the Lord of all.
Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you in this place, oh God. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Yes, we do. There is none like you, oh, oh God. We need you, Jesus. You are welcome in this place, oh God. This month of May brings new mission opportunities. Hopefully you have all read the article in the newsletter about the great work that Smash Kids Cancer is doing to continue the fight against cancer. The mission team of Wesley Church is pleased to announce that all donations made through the church for Smash Kids Cancer during the month of May will be matched up to $500 from our Second Mile Mission Fund. Just make a notation on your offering, envelope, or online giving. During worship today, I invite you to connect with our church family via the chat box to the right of your screen. There are three things to do there. One, right now there is someone God is putting in your heart. Maybe it's a son or daughter or a coworker or a friend. Whoever it may be, invite them to church today. The good news of Jesus is open to all and Jesus commands the church to be sharers of that news. So go ahead and click the invite button and bring someone to church with you today. Or send them the link now, wesley.online.church. That's wesley.online.church. And if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to hit the like and subscribe button and then share this video with a special person in your heart. Second, if you're new with us, be sure to fill out I am new here card and Pastor James will reach out to you sometime this week and guide you to grow deeper in your faith. Finally, throughout the service, be sure to share your joys and your concerns there and we would love to pray for you today. Remember, God loves you, and so do we. Please join us now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from Acts chapter 2, verses 29 through 41. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us today. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of all of us who are witnesses, being there for exalted at the right hand of God, and having experienced from the Father and the praise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you both see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstools. Therefore, that the entire house of the Israel know that with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you, sac you crucified. Now, when we heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins will be forgiven and that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, 
and for who and for who are far away everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him and he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them saying save yourselves from this corrupt generation so those who welcomed the message were baptized and that day about 3,000 people were added the word of God for the people of God thanks be to God Well, hey there, church. Pastor James here, coming to you from the Parsonage. I'm actually getting ready to head over to the Great New Jersey Annual Conference Mission and Resource Center in Neptune, New Jersey, to prepare for the ordination service happening later this week. On Tuesday, May the 25th at 10.30 a.m., I will be finally fully ordained in the United Methodist Church. So ordination in the Methodist Church is a little different from other denominations in that it's kind of like tenure. It takes a long time, a long process to get there. Um, and I've been in ministry, I've been a pastor for 10 years now. 2011 was when I first began as a licensed local pastor uh, in this denomination. And for 10 years, I've been serving the church. And here I am now, finally, being able to celebrate and being affirmed as a full elder in, uh, in the United Methodist Church. Uh, so it's happening again this Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. at GNJUMC. Org. So I hope that you can join us online, uh, watching the live stream, and uh, just to celebrate together this wonderful my milestone in my own ministry. And I thank you all for your prayers and your support, and I look forward to continue to serve you and this community. Uh, this is going to be a great opportunity. I hope that you can join us this Tuesday. Uh, another announcement that I wanted to share with all of you, and I'm really, really excited about this, is that on June the 20th, on June 20th, uh, we will be returning to indoor, in-person worship in our sanctuary. That's June the 20th. And we'll have two services at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Um, you know, things are opening up. Things are going back to the way they're used to a little bit. We're still, the virus is still here, but we are, our leadership is prayerfully uh, discerning and feeling we are ready to go back into uh, the building. Now, for those of you who are not ready, uh, do not worry, our church online, this, this experience will continue uh, every Sunday. You can tune in uh, right here at wesley.online.church. Um, and this, this worship service here, this online worship will continue. So you don't have to worry about missing out on that if you are not ready to return. But for those of you who are, I invite you to mark your calendars for June the 20th either 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. And I know there's a lot of questions, right? Uh, will there be childcare? Do I need to um, RSVP? What about Sunday school, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, you know, we're working on FAQs and those will be sent out to you as soon as possible. But I just want you to be aware that we are going back to the building on June 20th. So just mark your calendars and more information will follow. Uh, finally, uh, I just wanted to affirm and celebrate our pastoral intern, Braden Debrinia. So he had just finished his internship with us. Uh, you know, this past year, he has been our College Cultivate intern. And uh, my baby's over there making a little noise, so I apologize. Uh, but I just wanted to just say thank you to Braden. You know, he has served a lot behind the scenes because church has been a little different this past year. It's mostly online. Uh, he served in the kids ministry. Uh, he's preached. He's worked with the worship, making the online worship even better and being creative and thinking outside the box. And I'm just so thankful for Braden. And especially I'm thankful when Braden gets to preach because he is such a gifted speaker. God really speaks through him. And I'm very excited for this message where Braden will be uh, concluding his internship and also concluding our sermon series, Jesus Ruins Everything. So let's go now to Braden as he gives us uh, his final message as a college pastoral intern. Hello, Wesley Church family. Thank you so much for tuning in to worship. Today, we are continuing our sermon series titled, Jesus Ruins Everything. If this is your first time with us today, our sermon series is a spinoff of the popular college humor series titled Adam Ruins Everything, where comedian Adam Conover uncovers some of the most common misconceptions we have and ruins our beliefs. Over the last few weeks, we have seen our notions of politics, religion, racism, and money ruined and torn apart, only then to be repaired by Jesus' true teachings. Today, we wrap up with the last installment of the series titled Jesus Ruins Religion Part 2. What makes 
a successful church. Today is also Pentecost and the reception of the Holy Spirit to the disciples. We will be unpacking and understanding the true teachings of Jesus on this holy day. Would you please bow your head and pray with me before we begin? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reception of the Holy Spirit during the season of Pentecost. We are grateful for your presence instilled in us as disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. May you guide our church family through this exciting season of the year, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and redeemer. Amen. Church family, I'd once again like to thank you for joining me in worship today. It is an honor to be back up here and offered a chance to preach to you all. As many of you may be aware, this past year I have served as Pastor James' pastoral intern through the Cultivate program sponsored by Next Generation Ministries of New Jersey. However, uh, what many of you may not know is that my internship here at Wesley officially concluded on May 1st. I started this job in September, and it has been an incredible nine months. Uh, this internship has blessed me with the opportunity to serve a variety of roles and truly dive headfirst into the ministry leadership experience. I regret that the duration of my internship was behind closed doors and behind the scenes, but if you remember back to the summer of 2019 when I did the high school Cultivate internship, then you'll remember the incredible impact that this program had on me. Before we dive into today's scripture, I really wanted to emphasize some of the highlights from these past nine months. And most importantly, I want to thank you. Yes, you, each and every one of you watching today. Wesley has persevered through over a year of virtual worship, and I'm thankful for everything that you have done to keep our community not only strong, but resilient. You are more than appreciated. And I'm saying this because I value all of you more than you could ever know. Uh, almost two years ago, we might actually be a week or two off from the exact Sunday that this took place. Uh, I gave my first sermon here in the sanctuary, uh, and it was a very nervous and crudely crafted message on humility. I remember looking out at our congregation and seeing a sea of smiling faces, and to know in my heart, and in all of your hearts as well, that the church had taken a chance on a totally inexperienced 17-year-old high school kid and given him the pulpit, uh, the pulpit. It was such a mesmerizing idea. Throughout both of my official roles here at Wesley, I've always wanted to put an emphasis on our church's youth. Pastor James was the one who truly cultivated this idea in me, and he had a vision that Wesley's youth was not only a net positive, but essential to our church's growth. Before and a little bit after my first round as an intern, I served on our church council as the youth representative, a position which has since been taken up by our very own Nathan Witowski, and I know will continue to be taken up by more youth in the future. Additionally, Elizabeth Chin succeeded me as the second high school intern this past summer, and I'm more than confident that our youth will continue to step up and apply to this program in the future. Uh, my position as a church council representative was a learning experience and launch pad for all of my other endeavors. Uh, granted, I can remember falling asleep as an, as an exhausted junior year student, but that's okay. This past year, Pastor James appointed me to assist Michelle Biggs with our kids ministry program and it has been tremendously successful for such dis difficult circumstances. Uh, I've watched our youth group uh, as well remain vigilant throughout the year, switching many times from in-person um, to gathering in the parking lot to Zoom and back again. And I'm just so proud that we've stuck together. Church family, I'm sharing all these terrific things with you because as my official time as an intern wanes very quickly, I want to show you that this experience has not been a one-way street. These accomplishments for our youth are a reflection of this entire congregation, a congregation who each and every Sunday participates in our mission projects, logs our children onto Sunday school, connects with one another uh, in the chat, 
goes to virtual coffee hour, all these things. And you guys do every little thing to bring as much possible joy to Wesley. Our membership has grown. Our worship teams have expanded. Our small groups have been a success and our presence in the community has remained steadfast. It is a two-way street. And this experience has made me lucky enough to see that bigger picture. And I apologize if this sounds like I'm reading myself a really endearing resignation letter. I know it might be the vibe that I'm giving off, but I assure you this is not a goodbye by any means. Lord knows I'm not going anywhere and my ministry journey has barely begun. But what the Lord also knows is that Wesley Church's position within organized religion may not be as commonplace as we think. The reason I wanted to begin with pointing out the successes and highlights of the last year is because, as we know from Pastor James' sermon a few weeks ago, Jesus Ruins Religion Part 1, organized religion is on a steady decline. Last year, membership declined 2% or more for 18 of the United Methodist Church conferences. And in his message, Pastor James also pointed out that the Presbyterian and Lutheran churches were seeing steady membership declines as well. Pastor James also cited a Pew Research Center poll that said there had been a 12% decrease in younger Americans who consider themselves Christians over the last several years. So what is happening with the church? What is so horribly wrong that organized religion has become a sinking ship? And what does this mean for us? We as Wesley Church have been blessed with an unusual but otherwise very successful past year. And this begs the question, what outlines and defines the success of the church? I challenge you to think about that right now. What defines a church's success? Is it membership numbers increasing? Is it more mission projects being completed and higher donations? Is it more people coming to church every Sunday? If your answer to what a church's success looks like is any of these things, then you're not alone. These are the obvious answers. We believe a successful church to be a place with lots of members, and with that, a church whose financial situation is healthy and a church which has a flourishing ability to serve the community. The answer to the question of what defines a successful church uh, has the most obvious answers, which is membership. Membership defines church's success. And when we stop to consider what makes religion successful, we end up looking at characteristics rooted in statistics and numbers. Words like higher output, higher income, more volume, are the words that dictate a church's success. And this is a disheartening realization. Why is it that our line of thinking behind a successful church sounds a lot like the same line of thinking behind a successful business? Well, Pastor James put it simply and clearly in part one. Organized religion today is distracted. I want to share a quote from Paul David Hewson who I hope many of you will recognize this person's name, not as a philosopher, but as Bono, the lead singer from the band U2. Bono is quoted as saying, I often wonder if religion is the enemy of God. It's almost like religion is what happens when the spirit has left the building. At first, this quote may seem alarming. Surely it's impossible for religion to be the enemy of God. And to that point, I would agree. Religion is not the enemy of God. However, Bono's take that religion is the result of the spirit leaving the building is an equally alarming idea. It's a lot easier to think of religion as an organization because in truth, we have been conditioned as Christians to think the closer we're knit together and the more of us there are that can pull together and praise God, then the more effective our ministry will be. Throughout this entire sermon series, we have been tackling a common theme among our misplaced beliefs in politics, religion, racial identity, money. The common thing we hold is that there's strength in numbers. The more people who hold our values, the more people who vote for our candidates, the more quantities 
of dollar bills that we possess, then the more positive the outcome. It's a lot easier to tie this philosophy with religion and accept it as the way things should be. It's a lot harder to sit down and challenge ourselves to imagine what the church would look like if we removed our notions of organized religion. Now you may be thinking, what on earth am I talking about? The whole point is to praise God and share his love. Membership is important. And to that point, I say, yes, it is. But our approach to sharing God's love should not be focused on the statistical and numerical characteristics of the church. So what does the scripture tell us to do? Is our line of thinking correct? Are we skewed in how we view organized religion? Today is Pentecost. And the scripture today from the book of Acts give us a, gives us a twofold perspective on what it means to belong to a religious organization. Pentecost is derived from the Greek word Pentecostos, meaning 50, and marks the 50th, 50th day after Easter. Acts chapter 2 recalls the story of the first Pentecost and the birth of the organized Christian church as we know it. In scripture. In the scripture, Peter is giving a sermon to the disciples and he proclaims, Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is an epic revelation for the disciples. It had been 50 days since Jesus rose from his crucifixion, and now the disciples were getting confirmation that God had made Jesus both the Lord and the Christ. The scripture continues to say, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you, for your children, And for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added. This was the birth of the church. The disciples repented of their sins by accepting the gift of the Holy Spirit and repenting of their sins through baptism. The scripture emphasizes Pentecost as the reception of the Holy Spirit and with that, the baptism of the disciples. Uh, The scripture also places emphasis on the fact 3,000 new members were baptized that day, marking the birth of the church. But notice the scripture does not define the successful birth of the church the same way we define successful churches today. The church's success on the day of Pentecost was about the relationship between the coming of the Holy Spirit and the good news of Jesus Christ as the Lord and Christ. It is about the disciples hearing Peter's sermon 50 days after Easter and truly knowing Jesus was chosen to be Lord by God. The disciples rejoiced because they received the Holy Spirit not because they met a quota on baptisms and new members to the church. The membership and 3,000 baptisms were not the cause of the success, but the effect of the Holy Spirit entering into each of the disciples. In the modern organized Christian church, we have lost sight of this relationship. We believe that by focusing first on the conscription of new members, we will see the good news of Jesus Christ when in fact we need to be focusing on the cultivation of the Holy Spirit. I mentioned earlier the good news of Wesley Church and all the amazing triumphs we've had as a community. It is a thought-provoking challenge to pinpoint what makes a church successful. Like we mentioned earlier, it is easy to tie the success of a church to the same line of thinking as a business by focusing on high numbers and bringing in more people. However, These are assessments not related to the hearts and spirits of what the church truly is. We are not minions of the Lord, seeking to conscript as many to our cause as possible. We are passionate emissaries of Christ's love. 
The scripture today and the story of Pentecost tells us that the best assessments of a successful church come from the cultivation of Christ's love through the Holy Spirit in the hearts and minds of his disciples. Church family, I challenge you to think about what makes our church successful. This is a difficult but necessary question we must wrestle with as organized religion faces a decline. Of course, our goal is to spread the love of Christ to all who wish to receive it, but we cannot do that successfully until we stop viewing the church's success through inadequate assessments. On this day of Pentecost, we must strive to follow the teachings of Peter and his disciples, shifting our priorities away from organized religion and instead to the acceptance and reception of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are a faith community first. And I challenge you to think of what makes the church successful. You most likely will not think of an answer easily. My answer is my thankfulness to you, my gratitude for all the missions and experience Wesley has provided for me. Your answer may take a long time to be realized, but look to the reception of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. The church's success is to be made by assessments of our hearts and minds. Church family, thank you for coming to worship today. I cannot wait to gather with all of you in person very soon. Until then, be well and God bless. Thank you. Amen. Beloved, God commands his people to bring the tithe, that is, the first 10% of what we earn, back to the ministry of God's house of worship in order to remind us in a small way that all we have belongs to God and that we are part of a greater church called the, to transform the world together. So let us come before God today with our ties and say yes to God's call towards world transformation. If you are prepared to give, there are three ways that you can give today. You can mail your check to our church at 1500 Plainfield Avenue, South Plainfield, New Jersey, 07080. You can give online at wumcsp.org slash give, or you can give through the Tithely app. On behalf of Wesley Church, I want to thank you for your generosity. Because of your continued faithful giving, we can continue to be God's hands and feet to our hurting community and world. Please join me in the offering prayer. Compassionate God, thank you that you are our strength and our song. You fill our hearts with joy. Everything you have belongs to you and we rejoice to give some of our abundant gifts back to you. Bless the tithes and offerings we give today and let the majesty of the Creator be the light that guides us, the compassion of the Son be the love that inspires us, and the presence of the Spirit be the power that empowers us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I shall not be moved, I shall not 
not be I shall not be moved just like a tree Let's plant it by the waters I shall not be moved Though the tempest rages I shall not be moved On the rock of ages I shall not be moved just like a tree Let's plant it by the waters I shall not be moved I shall not be, I shall not be moved I shall not be, I shall not be moved Just like a tree that's planted by the waters I shall not be moved Just like a tree that's planted by the waters I shall not be moved Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah I shall not be moved And now receive the blessing. Go forth, children of the Most High God, recipients of the greatest love this world has ever known, knowing that you are loved by God, that our love for God goes beyond religion. That our love for God is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Go forth, church, on fire for the Lord, on fire for love, on fire to change the world. In the name of the one who is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Amen. Again, I hope that you could join us for the ordination service happening this Tuesday. And uh, I hope that you have a blessed, blessed week full of love, grace, and joy. Just know as you go and be safe. Know that you are loved. God loves you. And so do we. Take care. Let's say bye-bye.